going to kind of review some first semester stuff, uh, make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of some of the basics. Uh, we also will talk about maybe some things that uh, are relatable to what we'll see a lot. Uh, so we'll call this here. Uh, I'm just going to kind of freehand it. I don't really have any set notes or anything like that. Uh, we're going to call this Chem 50 Review. Yeah. All right. So we are next to the Chem 50 lab, which is next door if you want to go visit for old time sakes. Um, maybe that was your professor for Chem 50 next door. I don't know. All right. So we're going to start with kind of the basics uh, measurements. This, this is also a lab, right? So, so as you might know, whenever we take measurements, uh, there's always some degree of uncertainty in a measurement. The degree of uncertainty in the measurement really depends on the piece of equipment that you're using. Uh, so for example, if we take like a ruler, and maybe we got like an arrow happening there. Now, whenever you use any piece of equipment uh, in the laboratory when you're doing experiments, there's really kind of two sets of markings that you should always look at, as you might be familiar with. Uh, you should look at the large markings and really the small markings. And the large markings are the ones that actually usually have numbers. So there we go, a one and a two. So the difference here, <coughs> excuse me, and this particular case is uh, one centimeter. Then we usually want to look at the smaller markings that are between those large markings. And as you know, you do want to make sure that you count it correctly. And what I mean by that is, typically speaking, we usually start counting after the last large marking. So we would count like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we end at the next big marking, which would be 10 in this case. That means in this case, each of the small markings represents how much? One divided by 10 is 0.1 of a centimeter, right? Uh, and that means that this guy here is 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 1.7, 1 1.8, 1 1.9, and 2 as we go across there. So whenever you take a measurement, you should always have certain numbers that no matter who looks at it, everybody should agree. And in this case, my arrow is at least 1.3. This is what it's referred to as all the certain numbers, right? Now, my arrow clearly is not exactly at 1.3. It's not exactly at 1.4. It is somewhere between the two. And this is where the uncertainty in this measurement comes into play. I may look at it and think, well, to me, it kind of looks halfway there between those two markings. And I may record a five and obviously the unit with it. This is what is referred to as the first uncertain number. And when you make a measurement, you should always record all the certain numbers plus that very first uncertain number. And when you do that, by the way, that is what we like to call here significant figures. That means my number would have how many significant figures? It would have three significant figures in this particular case, right? By the way, also really important with measurements is the unit part of it, right? A number by itself is useless because if I say, hey, I have 100, what do I have? Nobody knows. I may have $100, may have 100 pennies, may have 100 apples. So without the unit, really the number is worthless. So when you record stuff in your notebook and lab and everywhere else in calculations, you should always have units associated with whatever you are doing. Now, we can look at this 
and uh, the scaling does change depending on the piece of equipment that you're using. Uh, so, for example, if we have, say, a wonderfully badly drawn graduated cylinder, hard to believe I failed art three times, but that is 10. Twenty milliliters. When we put a liquid into a glass container, right, we get a curvature of the liquid. Yeah, that's called the meniscus. Yeah. We read typically from the bottom of the meniscus, right? The reason that happens as you learn in Chem 50 ish, maybe. The attractive forces between the liquid and the glass container is stronger then the attractive forces between the liquid and itself. So the liquid that's in contact with the glass container through capillary action goes high, starts to rise up the walls of the container. That's the reason why in this case, in a U type of meniscus, we read from the bottom of the meniscus because without that attracted force, the actual volume is what's in the middle where it's not in contact with the glass uh, container that it's at. Not all substances give a U meniscus. I would say most do. Uh, you probably won't see it too much because they've taken mercury out of all labs, but mercury actually goes the opposite way. Makes a meniscus going in that direction where you would actually read from the top of the meniscus in this particular case. <clears throat> so we want to do the same thing here. Uh, this is 10, this is 20. And again, our large markings here are 10 milliliters. When we look at the small markings, between we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 markings. And again, that means in this particular case, each of our small markings represents one milliliter, 10 divided by 10 is one. That would be 11, that would be 12, that would be 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. From the bottom of the meniscus here, we can see it is at least 15, which is all of our certain numbers. Once again, maybe I feel it's a little above half, maybe I record six and our unit, and that will give us our three significant figures in this particular case, where the uncertain number is our last significant figure there, which is the 0. 0.6, usually means plus or minus one of that, so somewhere in that ballpark. Now, it's really important when you do take a reading that you do look at the scale because not all scales are the same. So you could have, for example, a graduated cylinder like this. So if we take a look at this, again, our large marking 10 and 20 there is going to be 10 milliliters. This case, though, we have one two, three, four, and five markings between the two. That means each of the small markings in this case represents how much? Two milliliters. That means uh, this would be 12, 14, 16, 18. Now when I come here, what should the reading be? Yeah, between 16 and 18 is actually 17 milliliters, yeah? How many significant figures is that? The uncertain number is the seven, yeah? So it does have two. The reason in this case is the spread between 16 and 18 is two. So there is no way in that little space to know where 16 ends, 17 begins. So the best we could do in this case is the whole number. If you can correctly identify where the smallest marking or what the smallest marking represents, you can easily figure out how far you could take your reading to. You usually you could go one more place to the right of the smallest marking. If you're not sure, you could also take the smallest marking divided by two. For example, that gives me 0 0.5 milliliters. And sometimes people record that as the uncertainty in this measurement. 15.6 milliliters plus or minus 0 0.5 milliliters. Basically, it goes to one decimal place, one decimal place. Here, we divide it by two is one milliliter. That would mean that this would be 17 milliliters plus or minus one milliliter, basically. Here, again, whole number. So if you're not really sure where you should take it, divide it by two, 0 0.05 centimeters, 1.35 centimeters, 
plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters, two decimal places, two decimal places. So usually in most cases, you go one more place to the right there, the smallest marking. If you're not sure, but you are fairly confident of what the smallest marking represents, you could divide it by two and have whatever number that goes to, one decimal place, whole number, two decimal places. That is how far you should take the reading to. Question on how to take measurements there. Clearly, when we take measurements here in the lab, uh, you should again have numbers, you have proper units. They all should be taken to the proper number of digits based on your equipment that you're using. In the digital realm, like in our balances, which is our scales, we record all the numbers because they're all important. So anything that is digital, you should record all of the numbers that are there. Any questions on that there? Speaking of significant figures, there are rules to count significant figures as you hopefully should be aware of. Uh, starting with obviously all non-zeros are significant. So if you had one, three, four, five, starting left to right, those are all gonna be significant figures. So this guy would have four significant figures. The zeros are what gives people some trouble sometimes. So if you have leading zeros, which are zeros that come before your first non-zero, they are not significant. So 0 0.0044, none of these are significant. We don't start counting until we hit that four. And that would give us two significant figures in this case. We have uh, captive zeros or trap zeros. Those are going to be significant. Those are zeros that are between two non-zero numbers, like 4004. So starting here, those guys are trapped. They're significant. And that guy's significant would give us four significant figures. And probably the zero at the end that gives people most trouble is the trailing zero. And those are going to be uh, significant if there is a decimal point in the number. So significant if there's a decimal point in the number. So for example here, uh, 0 0.003200. These are not going to be significant. We start counting here. Significant, significant. These two zeros will be significant because there is a decimal in this particular number. That's going to give us four in this particular case. Yeah. Now, significant figures comes from measurements, usually, and measured values. You may also be familiar. Remember, there are certain things that are known as exact numbers, right? Exact numbers are things that are counted, are definitions. Like 12 inches equals one foot. Right, so that is a definition. What exact numbers have is an unlimited number of significant figures. And when we do calculations that involve exact numbers, we ignore them in the calculation. We only look at really kind of the guys that are measured and have significant figures associated with it. A question on that there. Speaking of writing numbers, we sometimes use scientific notation, right? So we sometimes use scientific notation and that is the general form of n times 10 to the n that is a number between 1 and 10 it is not 10 or above it's got to be less than 10 can't be above 10 it actually can't be less than 1 either so it's got to be at least 1 but not more than 10 and times 10 to the n, this is either going to be a positive or negative number, depending on which way you need to move the decimal point to get to a number between 1 and 10. So 4.53. Actually, no, let's not do that. Let's do 4.5326. So in this case, uh, we would assume the decimal points here. So 1, 2, 3, 4 places to the left gives us 4.5326 times 10 to the 4. If it's a large number, you have a positive exponent. If it is a small number, you will have a negative exponent. 
So if we had something like 0 0.0032, we would go one, two, three places to the right, 3.2 times 10 to the minus three. Again, a number between one and 10, not like 100, 200, or something like that. When you write a number in scientific notation, all the numbers that come before the times 10 part, they are significant figures. That means that this number here has five significant figures. This number here has two significant figures. By the way, when you write a number in positional notation, which is like decimal form, to scientific notation or scientific notation back to decimal form, you shouldn't lose significant figures. Our original number here has five significant figures, which is why we kept all five when we went to scientific notation. Our original number here had two significant figures, and that is why we have only two significant figures here when we go to scientific notation. Now, sometimes the only way, right, that you can write a number with the correct numbers of significant figures for your answer is scientific notation. So for example, if I had 12,000 as my answer and I needed my answer to say three significant figures, there is no possible way to do that in a regular number form. Because if I put a decimal at the end, I now have five significant figures. Without the decimal, I have two significant figures. There's no way to get three. Would 120 be three significant figures? Would it be the right answer in this case? It would not because there's a very big difference between 12,000 and 120. If you don't believe me, imagine I owed you $12,000 and I said, I'll give you three significant figures. Here's 120 bucks, right? You're not gonna be very happy with that, right? So we never want to round, right? In the interest of getting significant figures, uh, and change the meaning of the number. So in this case, we would need to go 1.20 times 10 to the one, two, three, four places. And again, that would give us the three significant figures and keep the value of that number the same. So the nice thing about significant figures is our scientific notation is you really can't control how many significant figures you need. So if I needed four significant figures, all I would have to do is pop an extra zero in there, right? Now I got me four significant figures and so forth. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Speaking of something that just came to my mind when we we're talking about sort of measurements here, by the way, when I would do something like this, and let's just say my arrow was dead on that line at 1.3, what should I record? Should I record 1.3 centimeters? 1.30 centimeters. Is there a difference in terms of how you record that number if you're right on the 1.3 line? There is a difference. If you're not sure about it, this first number at 1.3 has how many significant figures? Two. The uncertain number here is three. So when you record it at 1.3 in this case, you're basically saying, I think it's 1.3 but maybe it's like 1.4, maybe it's 1.2. And clearly if I'm right on this line, that is a big room for error there, right? And it clearly is nowhere near either of those numbers as well. So we do not want to loft off any significant figures when we do it. We would want to record this, which it would have how many significant figures? This would be three significant figures. The uncertain number, estimated number would be the zero. And that's saying, I think it's 1.30, but maybe it's 1.31 or maybe it's 1.29, right? And that's like right there, which is pretty much what we see in our picture. So it's really important not to lop off numbers, even if you get right on the nose. Uh, and you want to make sure you don't actually add numbers either. So adding extra zeros when you shouldn't based on the equipment you're using is just as bad because you're saying it's much better of a measurement than it really is based on the equipment that you're using. So you wanna always make sure that you give the reading to the correct number. You wanna make sure you always use the right amount of uh, significant figures. Question on that. More important and more commonly, what most people do not know how to do correctly is actually punch scientific notation into your calculator.
you want to make sure in your calculator you actually know how to punch it in correctly. So on your calculator, we have an EE button. We have an EXP button. Some of the newer ones have a 10 to the end type button. And they also will have like a little wheel on there. Yeah. And most of the time, this combination, usually our calculators are kind of like two-toned. Got like one color on the front and kind of the sides are a different color. So these are actually your exponent buttons. These are actually the buttons that you should be using when you punch a number in scientific notation into your calculator. Also, a couple other buttons is your negative button, which on most calculators look like this or this, not your subtract button. Yeah. So when you punch a number into scientific notation, into your calculator, like we have something like this, it's really important to punch it in correctly, which most people do not do correctly. So you want to go 6.25, you want to hit your exponent button, which on most people's calculators, if you have one of these two, we'll put on your calculator 6.2 and an E, may put 6.25, put like a little times 10, pop up a couple of zeros. When you hit this button of this guy or this guy, it represents this part of the number. That means you should not hit the multiplication button. You should not be doing anything like shift and log in your button unless you want to be really off in a lot of our chapters. So you want to make sure that, that is the only button that you use for your exponent. Now, we have negative four left, so we want to make sure we use our negative button. And I'll put a negative there, and then we would hit four. I'll put a four and change that to a four. And that is the proper way to punch a number in scientific notation into your calculator to get the right answer, which I assume is what you want. Uh, if you're using or have used before, like the log button, and again, people sometimes use that because when they look at the log, they see like a 10 to the X and they think that's probably my exponent button. I should use that. So a lot of times they do like a second or shift in that. You do not want to use that. By the way, you typically don't want to use the little carrot or the multiplication button when you're doing it. That is exactly how you want to punch it in. Now, if you have this type of calculator, the only difference is your calculator, I'll just say it, program wrong, and it will do the wrong math if you are not very careful with it. So when you have a calculator that has these combi those combination of buttons, you actually have to put parentheses around every number that's written in scientific notation that you put in your calculator. So you would do the kind of the same thing. You would open a parentheses. You would go 6.25. You would hit your exponent button. On your calculator, it'll go 6.25. It'll go times 10. You'll have a little blinking cursor sitting right about there. At this point, you could do the rest. You'll do the negative button. And then you'll do the four. And what will happen is you'll have your 6.25 times 10 to the negative four. You will now have a little blinking cursor right about there. The problem with that little blinking cursor is it's small, which means if you close the parentheses at this point, you'll have a small parentheses and most calculators will give you an error at this point. So that is where the little wheel comes into play. You actually want to hit the right hand side of the wheel. And what that will do is bring your little blinker down to regular size. And it will now look something like this with a regular size blinker. And now you can close the parentheses. And you will now have, for that type of calculator, your number typed in correctly. Clearly, it looks like a lot of steps. I wrote each individual step, but it goes really quick once you understand how to do it. Uh, but you definitely, for every number, if you have that type of calculator, you need to put parentheses around any number that you write in scientific notation. Uh, otherwise, it will give you the wrong answer. Now, if you're not sure where your exponent button is, uh, you could come find me and we'll find it together. But why don't we try one just to make sure. Let's say we have 6.25 times 10 uh, to the minus 11, and we want to divide it by 7.2 times 10 to the, uh, we'll do 14. So go ahead and punch that in. I'll do it as well. This would be probably the proper way to do it. 6.25, you hit your exponent button. You hit your negative button. You hit 11. You hit your divide button. You hit 7.2. Once again, exponent button. We have a positive exponent here, so we don't need the negative. And then you hit equals. 
And if you do all that good stuff on my display, I get 8.680555556E minus 26. I got something like that staring at me here. All right. So a couple of important things when you punch your thing into here, scientific notation gives you an answer in scientific notation. Here we would go with perhaps something like 8.7. A lot of times people miss this part of the number in their calculator. Some calculators will do like a times 10 to the minus 26 at the end. They sort of forget about that part of the answer uh, when they punch it in. You should write it as times 10 to the minus 26 in this particular case. When you are writing answers in scientific notation, you should not use the E. Yeah, that is not a way to do it when you're writing things in scientific notation or in your lab report. So in your lab report, you should do times 10 to the whatever. You shouldn't use the E. Although we do use E's on calculators, we do use the E, by the way, on Excel to put a number in scientific notation. Uh, but when you're writing it as sort of an answer or displaying your answer, you should do that. So again, you want to make sure that you don't forget sort of the times 10 part uh, when you do give the answer. I can't tell you how many people would just write like 8.7 at this point and kind of forget the back part of the number. So you want to make sure you do that. If you find yourself having the correct sort of front part of the answer, but this part is incorrect off by like one or so, it is probably the way you are punching into your calculator. So again, like I said, at some point, if you're not sure, just bring your calculator up and we'll figure it out together on your particular one. That I would say is probably the three most common ways on a calculator buttons to punch something in scientific notation. Um, now there are some calculators that kind of look like uh, this one. They don't have an exact wheel like that, but they have kind of like a broken wheel. <laughs> it doesn't look like a circle and just kind of have the buttons. On those type of calculators, oddly, you actually don't need to put parentheses and it gives you an error if you do. So sometimes calculators are a little finicky in terms of how they're programmed and stuff like that. So again, if you need help, let me know. Uh, but it is really, really important that you know how to punch those numbers incorrectly into your calculator. We will use numbers and have numbers in sort of scientific notation in a lot of places along the way. So uh, you don't want to compound errors by punching it in and incorrectly. Any questions on that there? Okay. All right, so scientific notation. By the way, when we talk about things like being accurate, right? Or being precise, right? There is a difference between those things, right? If you're accurate, you are close to the true value, right? If you are precise, that is how close a set of numbers are to one another. So the classic example is the bullseye, right? You throw some darts at a board. So I throw my darts, I hit, I hit, miss the board. Sad. Am I precise? Am I accurate? I am neither, right? I missed the bull board pretty badly there. So I go double or nothing here. I pick up my darts and ruin my board. And now my board is smaller, which is going to make it much harder to hit, I imagine. There you go. And I throw my darts here, and I land them all here. Am I precise? Am I accurate? I am not. I'm precisely not accurate, right? And this brings up a really good point that you can uh, be pretty precise. You can even do the wrong thing the same way every time, yeah? So you're consistent in doing the wrong thing in the same way every time. You get the same result. It just happens to be the wrong result, right? So that's not good. We can pick up our darts here, right, and throw them. And uh, we hit, say, here. Am I precise? Am I accurate? Yeah, so I'm precise and accurate here. And that's really the goal when you do experiments, right? You want to be accurate. You want to get the right answer. You also want to be precise. We look at precision a lot of times for things like reproducibility, why we do multiple trials of an experiment, right? To see if we get the same answer every time that we do it. Uh, so we represent these in calculations, which we'll use a number of places 
uh, our friend percent error, perhaps. Yeah. A little experimental minus true divided by true value times 100%. Yeah. Do I want a large percent error or small percent error? I do want a small percent error, right? You don't want like a 200% error, even though you can say like I did it 200 times worse than the next person next to me, right? So that's not so good. Uh, when we look at precision, which is reproducibility, we look at things like standard deviation, percent deviation, uh, you know, those are things that we look at in terms of precision. When we do experiments, you do look at those things and you do will be doing some of those calculations like calculating percent error, uh, calculating percent, percent uh, deviation. And those are things that you want to look at. Those are things that you could talk about as well. You know, was your experiment reproducible? Did you get the same result? Did you get the right result uh, along the way? Um, now, also important is how we do problems in chemistry. Uh, which, as you probably know, is uh, what is referred to as dimensional analysis, right? Dimensional analysis is a way where we use equalities, like uh, one foot is 12 inches. That's an equality. An equality is two values that are on different units, but represents the same amount of whatever it is. From any equality, you could get conversion factors, right? And they're just fractions. One foot over 12 inches or 12 inches over one foot. So when we set up a problem, like we want to know, you know, how many feet there are in uh, 625 inches, right? How many feet would that be? We set up our calculations to show our work like you will do, right? using our conversion factor. Opposites cancel, so inches on top, inches need to be on the bottom, opposite location to cancel, because it's 12 inches is one foot. Inches divided by inches equals one, basically. Same if you took two divided by two equals one. Inches on top, inches on the bottom equals one, they cancel out. Then we would take basically whatever's on top here and multiply. Whatever is on the bottom, we divide, right? So we take uh, 625, we uh, times it by one, which we don't really need to do. And then we divide it by 12 in this case, which would give us 52.1 feet. And that is the way you should show your work in chemistry in here is dimensional analysis with units, canceling conversion factors, right? Speaking of which, when we do calculations, we want to give answers to the right number of significant figures. So as you hopefully remember, right, when you multiply and divide, your answer should have the same number of significant figures as the number with the least number of significant figures. And that is different than when we add and subtract, right? When we add and subtract, we are looking at what? We're looking at decimal places, yeah? And it also is the least number of decimal places is what your answer should have. Obviously ignoring anything that is a exact number. So if I had four to five times 1.2 and I divided it by four, four, three, seven. If we were doing this, we would do what's in the parentheses first. That is multiplication. That means technically this guy has three significant figures. That has two significant figures. The top part technically should have two significant figures, right? We're then going to divide by what's on the bottom, which has four significant figures. So we're dividing by four significant figures, which means our answer should actually end up with two significant figures in this particular case. Uh, so again, if you did that on your calculator, we will end up with 0 0.11494529. We actually should end right there, 0.11 looks like a winner.
if you're adding, you are looking at decimal places. So if you added all this together, we'll try without the calculator and see how we do. So that's a, a six, that's a one, that looks like a, maybe a four, and a six is a seven. Here, this is adding. So we're looking at decimal places, three decimal places, one decimal place, three decimal places. Smallest is one decimal place, which is 7.4. 7.4 has one decimal place, but two significant figures. And that is what our answer should be. Should you do a lot of rounding all the way through your calculation if you're doing a lot of steps or should you wait to the end? You should wait to the end, yeah? So you don't want to round, especially if you're going to use that number and more calculations. Otherwise, you will find yourself rounding error, they call it, and you'll be moving more and more away from the right answer. Personally, I don't round. I just take the whole number on my calculator and continue on with the calculation. If you're going to write it down, keep a couple of what they sometimes call guard digits, a couple extra digits along the way, and that will help prevent any type of rounding error. Any questions on that there? Yeah. Now, very common sort of conversions that we do, our friend molar mass, yeah? Molar mass is what units? Typically, not everybody at once. That is uh, grams per mole, perhaps, yeah? We can find the molar mass on like the periodic table. A little carbon, 12.01, right? A little hydrogen, maybe, 1.008. We typically can grab it off of there. That's how many grams there are per mole. And we usually go about four significant figures when we do so. So if we had like a C2H4 situation and we wanted the molar mass, it would be two times 12.01 grams per mole for the carbon plus four times 1.008 grams per mole for our hydrogens in this case. And that's going to give us our molar mass for this particular compound of about uh, 28.05 grams per mole. We can use molar mass in dimensional analysis like a conversion factor. You could use it as a conversion factor. The number always stays with the grams and it's always per one mole. Or you could flip it around and use it the other way if you needed to. Molar mass is really our conversion factor to go back and forth between grams and moles, which is something that we do a lot in chemistry, right? Not to be confused with our friend Avogadro, which we don't use all that often. Avogadro's number 6.022 times 10 to 23. That is what we use to go between moles and atoms or molecules. It's Avogadro's number. Really don't use that all that much, but molar mass we do use a lot, obviously, here. Question on molar mass. So. <clears throat> all right. So uh, let's talk then about some other important things. Obviously, equations, yes, and understanding equations and how they are written. As you hopefully know, we have reactants, which is our starting material. They go to products, right, which is what is produced as a result of a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction is a chemical change. What you start with and what you end with are different things. In a chemical reaction, what actually happens? What, get, what is actually happening to the reactants? How do you get to the products? It's actually bonds being broken, right? Electrons, right? You break all these bonds and you make all these bonds, right? All about electrons and breaking and making bonds. So uh, when we write equations and formulas, uh, we sometimes will use little subscripts to indicate the state of whatever we're looking at. Uh, where obviously S is solid, right? L is liquid, G is gas, AQ is aqueous, right? Water environment. Is there a difference between aqueous and L? There is. Aqueous is a solution, which means you took something 
and dissolved it, like you took some sodium chloride and dissolved it in water. Liquid is a pure liquid, like just water by itself, nothing else with it. So that is the difference between them. They really are in the same state. We have conservation of mass, right? Which means we don't lose anything along the way in the chemical reaction. That's why uh, all we're doing is breaking bonds, basically. That means when we use an equation, it should always be balanced, right? And we balance the equation by using coefficients. So maybe like a two there, maybe like a three there. And we have a balanced equation in this particular case. Remember that pretty much a, an equation is useless if it's not balanced, right? We always want to make sure it's balanced. By the way, if I wanted the molar mass of H2, do I take the three into account when I calculate molar mass? The answer is no. So when you calculate molar mass, it's just based on the formula. So this would be two times 1.008 grams per mole, uh, which would give us our 2.016 grams per mole. You always do it based on the formula, regardless of what the coefficient is in the balanced equation. That is the definition of molar mass, how many grams there are per one mole, right? These numbers, as you know, from stoichiometry is also the moles of each of those. And in that case, that is three moles. So you never, ever would want to use the coefficient when you're calculating molar mass. You should just use the formula by itself to do so. Uh, any questions on that there? By the way, sometimes things are written up there on top of the arrow. Those are sometimes referred to as a catalyst, right? A catalyst, as we'll talk a little bit about in the first chapter, is something that's usually there to speed up a chemical reaction. It is uh, not a product. It is uh, not a reactant. And it actually does not get used up. It is there basically just to facilitate that reaction happening a lot faster um, in most cases. And so sometimes you'll see, like, for example, on top of the arrow, like a metal written, you might see H plus written, uh, which is an acid catalyst. Uh, so a lot of times on top of that arrow, you'll see some catalyst sort of written. Now, when we do calculations from equations and using those uh, numbers that are in front, that is known as stoichiometry, right? So we do stoichiometry type calculations uh, using a thing like this, like N2 plus 3H2. And we could do stoichiometry by doing what's referred to as the mole to mole relationship. We could say for every one mole of N2 we put in there, we get three moles of H2. For every three moles of H2 we put in there, we get three mo uh, two moles, sorry, two moles there. Coefficients, basically. Two moles there of, uh, that one was three, huh? This one is two moles of NH3. And uh, for every uh, three moles of H2, uh, we get, uh, I did that one, huh? So which one am I saying there? There it is. One mole of N2. We get two moles of NH3. That one was a three there. <laughs> so these are our mole to mole relationships that we could use to figure out things uh, like you know, how much product we would produce if we started with a certain amount of N2. So if we knew the grams of N2 we started with, Say we had 40 grams of N2 and we want to know how many grams of NH3 we would produce. What we would do is take the 40 grams of N2, we would use the molar mass of N2. The grams would cancel. We would then do our mole to mole relationship. Uh, one mole of N2 gives us two moles of NH3. Those guys will cancel, and then we would do our molar mass of NH3, moles of NH3, or grams of NH3. Those guys will cancel, and that will give us our grams of NH3. That is what is sometimes referred to when you start out with how much reactant to figure out how much product that you produce. 
That is what is known as the theoretical yield. Right. Which is the maximum amount of product that you should produce if everything went correctly in this particular reaction. You had no side reactions. There is actually what is known as the actual yield, which is actually what you get when you do the experiment. And that is what is known as percent yield, we sometimes calculate, uh, which is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100%. We want usually a high percent yield, right? Do we want a percent yield that's over 100%? Is that usually a good thing? That is usually not a good thing. That usually means you screwed up somewhere along the way. You have a lot of water weight that you shouldn't have and things of that nature. When we do stoichiometry, there's also a sometimes referred to as limiting reagents, right? Or limiting reactants, whatever they call it these days, yeah. And that is when you are given the starting amount of both reactants and you're able to get the moles of both reactants. You actually have to figure out which one is the limiting reagent. The limiting reagent is really important because that is the one that determines how much product you will produce, right? It is the one that really determines how much you will make. The excess reagent is the one that you have plenty of. You'll have leftover it of it when it's all said and done. Uh, you'll have plenty of it kind of left over. I won't go into how to do limiting reagent type problems because there's multiple ways. I think nowadays most people are taught, correct me if I'm wrong, to do two separate calculations. Whichever one produces the least amount of product is your limiting reagent. Is that pretty much how everybody's taught these days? So bad, they teach it that way. There's multiple ways you teach it. Sometimes you could also do a calculation between the two reactants to see if you have enough, uh, how much you need of one to use up the other and see if you have enough of it. And if you do, it's uh, the excess reagent. If you don't, it's limiting. Or you could have been taught a way that would be very helpful for this class, which most people aren't, uh, and do like a table or an ice table type of approach for that, uh, which is sometimes used for that. But if it is a limiting reagent problem, you do have to somehow figure out, you know, which one is the limiting reagent because that's the really important one. That again is the one that determines how much product that you make. All right. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right. Uh, then uh, speaking of reactions, there are different types of reactions. And as you may know, basically there are two main categories of reactions. There are what are referred to as double displacement reactions. Well, it has a general formula, something that looks like this, where these are both ionic compounds and the two positive guys switch partners and make two new ionic compounds on the other side. The result of this is one of two things will probably occur in a double displacement reaction like this. Uh, one of those guys might make a solid, which is sometimes more specifically called a precipitation reaction as a precipitate or solid is made. So a precipitation reaction is a specific classification of double displacement reactions where a solid is formed based on solubility rules. Did I say that? Solubility rules, yes as to when two things come together, whether or not you will get a solid. We have a whole chapter on solubility coming up along the way. The other thing that very common that you find a double displacement reaction is acid and base reactions. When you do a reaction of an acid plus a base, perhaps you remember you get two things, you get our friend a salt and water basically, right? Water is H2O, salt is an ionic compound. By the way, what makes up an ionic compound? It is a, what two things? What two things make up an ionic compound? A metal and a non-metal, right? And a metal will make an ion, right? A cation, which is positively charged. Non-metal will make an anion, which is negatively charged. Is there sharing of electrons in ionic compound? There is not. What holds it together is the positive charge of the cation and the negative charge of the anion. We call that electrostatic attraction, no sharing of electrons happening in that case. So an acid-base reaction is a very common one. And 
really in this particular case a precipitate sometimes referred to as a precipitate this is really double displacement reactions it's sort of the big category for which more specifically it could be a precipitation reaction or acid base reaction but it, it accounts for two of the three reasons why a reaction takes place there's really kind of three reasons why a reaction takes place One is the formation of a precipitate. The formation of water. And the third one is a transfer of electrons. So there's your water being formed. There's your precipitate being formed. Double displacement reactions pretty much take care of two of the three reasons why a reaction takes place. So what is the third reason? The third reason is really the other classification of a reaction, the big umbrella, which is our friend, the redox reactions. Yeah, Redox reactions is the big classification. Those are oxidation and reduction reactions. Maybe you learned some of that in Chem 50, depending. Sometimes they go a lot into detail or sometimes a little bit of detail. I think you have an experiment you did on that. Basically, uh, oxidation means somebody has lost some electrons. Somebody has gained electrons. Leo the lion goes grr, right? Loss of electrons, oxidation, gaining of electrons, reduction. People are fond of oil rig these days. Oxidizing is losing, reducing is gaining. Um, but that is basically what it is. They actually always happen together. So if somebody loses electrons, somebody's going to gain electrons. And that is basically going to be a transfer of electrons, which is the third reason why a reaction takes place is a redox reaction. What are redox reactions? They are more specifically sometimes classified as your synthesis combination reaction, where two things make one thing. Your decomposition reaction, one thing breaks apart into two or more things. Your single replacement reactions, where you have one thing by itself, a metal or non-metal, plus an ionic compound. And if this was a metal, it will come in and kick out the guy right there and make a new ionic compound, and that guy will come out by itself. In order for this reaction to take place, whatever is coming in needs to be more reactive than what it is replacing. That is like an activity series. Maybe you remember, you maybe learned about in Chem 50 and stuff like that. Also, part of redox reactions are combustion reactions. Although most people think of combustion reaction as the organic combustion reaction, which means you have a carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen sort of guy, plus a little O2, make some CO2 and water. Like when you light your Bunsen burner, a little methane, some oxygen, a spark, you get flame. Really, the only thing that you actually need for a combustion reaction, by the way, is just oxygen being present is really the only thing that you need for it to technically be considered a combustion reaction. That's why if you take a look at, we were talking about the magnesium thing earlier when you burn it in fire, take magnesium, some plus some oxygen, make a little magnesium oxide. This could be classified a bunch of ways. That is two things that make one thing, which means it's a synthesis reaction. That is a redox reaction. Oxidation state zero, plus one, minus two. Transfer of electrons. And it could also be combined as a combustion reaction because it's O2 is involved. So you can't classify the same reaction in multiple ways, depending on what you're looking at. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes we look at one sort of aspect of it over another. Question on types of reactions. Speaking of equations, types of reactions, really important in this class to be able to write equations with the proper formulas and know what's going on. Part of your grade on your work is to be able to write those equations. As bad as this is going to sound, it's just the way this class is. 
equations are oftentimes not given to you. You're given the information about what's happening and you have to understand what's going on as we talked about earlier and be able to write the proper equation based on the situation. So as we get to that middle part of the class, you know, after the first chapter, all that equilibrium stuff, there's a lot of situations where that you kind of only get like, okay, these two things are going to come together and you have to draw upon your knowledge to be able to figure out what's going to produce and be able to write the equation correctly to do the calculation. So that is an extreme part of this class where people struggle a lot. They try to McFake it a lot with the math, like, oh, I've seen this math a lot, so I'm just going to roll with the math. I don't really know what's going on. And it doesn't usually turn out well uh, for a lot of people. And they really struggle with the equation part and writing it. And unfortunately, a lot of times you kind of have to start at that point to kind of do the calculation. So it kind of freezes a lot of people when they try to do calculations in this class. So if writing equation is troublesome for you, understanding what you get when these two things come together, I would highly recommend you kind of review writing equations, what you get in like, we do a lot of acid base stuff in this class. So look at, you know, when these acid and bases come together, what do they make? You know, double displacement reactions are very common that we come across a lot in this class. We do hit a lot of single replacements when we kind of get into the electrochemistry, which is really redox and stuff like that. But opening up, just understanding how to write those equations is really, really important for the calculation part in this class and where a lot of people really do struggle with, like, I'm not really sure. And that does lead a lot of people down a really bad road of I'm just going to try to fake it a little bit with like what I remember sort of happening. So don't, don't fake it. Yeah. Make sure you kind of know how to do that. It's going to make it a lot easier, hopefully for you. Now, a couple of last things we're talking about here to close out uh, some important review things. Solutions are really important. We obviously deal with a lot of solution equilibrium and, and solutions. In lab, we make a lot of solutions, so that's really important. By the way, as you hopefully know, a solution is made up of two parts. It is the solute, right, and the solvent, right? Solute is the smaller part of a solution. The solvent is the larger part of the solution, right? So as we were talking about before, NaCl solid plus a little H2O liquid, comes together, the solid will dissolve in the liquid. This is going to be our solute. That will be our solvent. Comes together and makes a sodium chloride solution, right? which is a homogeneous mixture, right? Homogeneous mixture means looks the same throughout. Um, if you're not sure what the solute is, it is always the name of the solution. So if you have a sodium chloride solution, that is the solute. You have a hydrochloric acid solution, HCl is your solute. So whatever the name of the solution is, uh, typically we'll have the aqueous symbol next to it uh, is a solution. Water is a very common solvent. Is water a good solvent for everything? Will water mix with everything? It will not. Perhaps you learned and remember this famous saying of like dissolves like, yes? So things that are polar and polar, are good, they mix. Things that are ionic and polar mix okay because they do ion-dipole interaction, right? And things that are nonpolar, nonpolar are all good with each other. But if you try to cross over something that's polar and nonpolar, not a good mix. Oil and water, right? They don't mix together. Oil is nonpolar, water is polar. The reason they really don't mix is the intermolecular forces that you probably learned about in Chem 50 like dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, dispersion forces, things mix together well because if they're using the same type of intermolecular force that they use with themselves and somebody else comes along and uses the same type of intermolecular force, they will be able to interact well with each other. So you get two things that come together, the hydrogen bond normally with itself, they will have no trouble the hydrogen bond with each other. If they come together and normally do dipole-dipole interaction, they will have no problem with that as well. When we talk about solutions, our friend concentration is very important, right? And our most famous one of concentration is molarity, right? That is capital M, which means moles per liter. That also means that if I want to solve for liters, that is moles divided by molarity. 
dare I say, if I want to solve for moles, which is really common, that is liters times molarity, right? When you have a 4.5 molar sodium chloride solution and you want to do a calculation with it, you probably were taught perhaps it's a good idea to get rid of the big M and convert it into like a conversion factor, which means that is how many moles per one liter it is. Or you could flip it around and use liters on top, 4.5 moles on the bottom and do it like a conversion factor in dimensional analysis. You need the volume to be in liters, right? When you multiply it by molarity so that you actually get moles, which is probably what you're looking for. Is it okay or can you multiply milliliters times molarity? The answer is you can, but do you get moles? You do not. You get what our friend is called millimoles, which if you're not aware of that, you will be off by a factor of a thousand. But if you divide it by milliliters, milli and milli cancel, you're left with moles per liter, which brings you back to molarity. Yeah. So you can multiply molarity by milliliters, but it does give you millimoles. In most cases, you want moles. So to be safe, if you're ever using molarity by itself, you should always make sure the volume's in liters so that you get moles, which is probably what you want to use anyways in your calculation, and you're not off by a factor of a 1,000. Speaking of which, right, we also do dilutions a lot in this class. Dilutions is when we add more solvent. To our solution. How does that affect the molarity? Well, since molarity is technically moles of solute divided by liters of solution, and since the solution is the solute plus the solvent, when we do a dilution, the only thing that we add is really more solvent, which is increasing the liters part of our molarity, which means that's going to give us a bigger number on the bottom and we will see our molarity go down, right? It's because we're diluting it. We're adding more water, for example, increases the volume of the solution, makes the bottom number larger, smaller molarity. Perhaps you learned M1V1 equals M2V2 for a dilution equation. I know they teach C1V1 equals C2V2 these days, I imagine, right? <laughs> Are either one of those. So M is the molarity and volume. Molarity and volume usually before the dilution and after the dilution. C is just generic for concentration unit. V is volume, concentration unit, volume. The reality is you could use any concentration unit and use this equation, which is why sometimes people are taught C1, V1 equals C2, V2. You do percent mass to mass, percent volume to volume. You use any type of one that you want. We use this for dilutions. I hope you were not taught to use it for titrations. I hope not. Or stoichiometry, because that would be not correct in all cases. You get lucky occasionally, but it will not work right for you. You should do a stoichiometry problem for something like a titration problem, not really rely upon this. Confusing sometimes is, if you Google it, some people will call this the titration equation, and it's really not. Shouldn't be used for all titrations. So... Uh, when we solve for M1, that is the concentration or more dilute solution. V1 is the volume of our more, I'm sorry, more concentrated solution, M1. V1 is the volume of that more concentrated solution. M2 is the more dilute solution concentration, and V2 is the volume. Now, in this equation, you can leave it in milliliters and times it by molarity. And let's say you wanted to solve for M2 and you left this guy in milliliters, the milliliters will cancel and it will be okay. Uh, so this is the one place where if you wanna leave it in milliliters, the volume, if you're doing a dilution equation, it's all good. Uh, what you'll get in terms of volume is milliliters out. And if you put both milliliters in, it'll work out okay. Cause technically when you do this top part, you get your millimoles we talked about divided by your milliliters, those guys cancel. And now you got your moles and liters back and you have your molarity back. So the only place really with molarity that you can probably safely leave your volume in milliliters is if you're doing some type of dilution. Any questions on that? Now, 
let's say for example we had a table we're going to make some test tubes and we got uh solution a solution b and creatively solution c in this case right and let's say we're going to make uh a few test tubes here let's just say a has a concentration of five molar b has a concentration of two molar the kind of stock bottle you're going to grab off of the shelf and C has a concentration of one molar, right? And let's just say in this first test tube, we're going to mix together, you know, five milliliters of this guy, four milliliters of this guy, and one milliliter of this guy. And this one, we're going to take six milliliters of this guy, three milliliters of this guy, and one milliliter of this guy. So I do that, right? And I put it into here, test tube number one. And I want to make this solution right here. So my question is, when I dump A into here, B, and C into this test tube, what is the concentration of A when I put it into the test tube? Is it 5 molar? And I put it in there with all the other stuff. Is it 5 molar or does it change? Again, it's very quiet. So I'll ask the same question about B and C. Is B two molar? Is C one molar? The answer is it changes. When you pop A in here, for example, right? You just put five milliliters of A in there. Then you popped in there two, uh, four milliliters that are a B and one milliliter of C, not drawn to scale, Clary, right? I have just did what when I put all those together? I just did our friend a dilution, yeah? The volume of all those guys have now changed, right? Which means the molarity changes as the volume changes. So we do not have five molar A anymore in there. We do not have two molar B in there anymore. We don't have one molar C in there anymore. So if we wanted the molarity of A in the mixed solution, it is really a dilution problem. So we had originally M1V1 equals M2V2. So if we did it for A, our original concentration was 5 molar. We used 5 milliliters. My M2 is what we're trying to figure out what the new concentration is. What would my V2 in this case be? What is the total volume of everything after I mix all this together? It is 10 milliliters, right? Five, four, one, that is 10. That all went into the pool together, right? So 10 milliliters, right? So when I solve for M2 in this case, I have uh, five times five divided by 10. My molarity of A in that mixture is actually 2.5 molar. That would be the same thing for B. You would have to do a calculation for B the same way. For B, our original molarity was two molar. We used four milliliters of it. Our new molarity in our 10 milliliters that we just did. Again, for B, if we solve for it, it would be two times four divided by 10. In that mixture, B is 0 0.8 molar. So, very commonly in this class, we make a lot of solutions. And very commonly, we make a lot of solutions from a table like that. And very, very commonly, you're asked to what is the concentration or molarity of those components of that solution in the mixture. And very common people go, oh, it's uh, what's on the bottle, right? Which is this guy. But you have to remember that when you toss it in there with a bunch of other things, you're actually doing a dilution, even though it doesn't really seem like you're doing a dilution, but you're adding obviously a lot more volume, right? Anytime you add more reagents to each other, you're essentially doing nothing but diluting down your actual sample because most solutions are water-based, which means you're actually adding a lot more water in there every time you add another reagent with it. So this right here is a very common sort of calculation that we do in lab, especially in the first couple of experiments, for sure. Uh, you want to make sure that when you go to do these calculations, that you just don't run with what the molarity is on the bottle. 
especially if you put them all into some test tubes together, you made like a solution and a mixture of all those things. You want to make sure that you get the correct concentration of each of those components in the mixture. Any questions on that there? So to conclude with, we do a lot, obviously, with solutions in this class. We do a lot with molarity. We do a lot with making solutions, dilutions. As I mentioned earlier, we do a lot with having to write equations. So these are things that, again, if you uh, struggle with, uh, will help you. Uh, you know, as you go through this class, you'll see these things. Definitely the writing equations is a really big hurdle for a lot of people being able to come up with those equations. And that helps you understand what's going on is really big trouble. And this sort of molarity dilution solution type situation and figuring out, you know, what is the concentration of things is also a very big hurdle for a lot of people in this class. So uh, I did put up on Canvas a module that has some review of some of these topics that we just talked about. Um, so you might want to go through them or kind of look at, you know, those chapters again, and that will sort of hopefully help you out. Any questions on any of that stuff there?